afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to present my um, progress. So my PhD topic is uh, the application of artificial intelligence in COVID-19 severity prediction. Uh, my name is Marton Rakovic, and besides being a PhD student here, I'm also a statistician at the Tushlar University uh, Department of Statistics. Uh, excuse me, my uh, supervisors are Andra Harnos and Peter Fehrvári, and uh, my SMS is Fanny Vezdarich, and the statisticians aiding me are Peter Fehrvári and Tomás Koi. Uh, my vision is to make AI an everyday tool um, in healthcare, and to achieve this, um, I would like to develop um, AI severity prediction tools for different diseases. Um, so the two ongoing projects I have um, are these listed. The first one is a meta-analysis um, on the efficacy of early severity prediction models in COVID-19. And the second one is, is a, an organic continuation of the first one. It's a registry data analysis about uh, developing such a model. Um, so as we probably uh, all know, um, COVID, um, the COVID pandemic has affected around six, uh, 680 million uh, people and about, uh, with about uh, 6.8 million mortalities. And currently there are still around 60,000 reported cases worldwide, which is on the level of March, 2020. And uh, we know that uh, characteristic of this disease is a uh, rapid uh, deterioration of patient condition. So we'd like to uh, make correct decisions on possible severity as, as, um, as soon as possible. And we also know that even in developed countries such as Switzerland, um, high ICU uh, occupancy um, the, the, uh, worsens patient outcomes. So we would like to uh, effectively allocate resources as much as we can. So the fundamental question is which uh, prediction tool should we use uh, in this case? And our aim was to quantify the performance differences between the different available tools. Um, so we, we've we um, looked at uh, COVID-19 positive patients. We were comparing the different prediction models um, the main categories are like deep learning or AI models or neural networks. So these, these are one category. The second one is other machine learning models. And the third uh, main category is a clinical score, the simpler models, basically. And the outcome we were looking at was severity. And we've measured model uh, performance using AUC sensitivity specificity, so the usual metrics. The, our initial hypothesis was that uh, deep learning, so AI models, are superior to simpler ones. And we'll see that um, it may not exactly be the case. Um, this is our search key, and um, it, that yielded around 27,000 results. And we've um, uh, ultimately selected close to 500 texts in the end for data extraction. Uh, so we've done that uh, with all the... Uh, analysis and the, the target journal uh, is science advances and uh, we're close to completing the the manuscript oops uh, so the 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 primary result is this that there is difference between um, the different uh, tool types for severity prediction you can see the adjusted uh, error under curve values here um, it's important to note that there were many possible confounding factors uh, when assessing model performance, and we've tried to control for many of these, and we use a MetaForest machine learning model specifically designed for such problems to, uh, to tackle um, the, pro the problem of many possible confounders. Um, just um, a, a couple of couple of results from the meta regression we've done uh, with the selected and with uh, the selected control variables we see that com uh, compared to uh, simpler linear classifier models um, machine learning models are no and neural networks uh, are both better but actually uh, between those two there isn't much of a difference um, but there's an important um, other um, um, attribute of uh, these models as well. Um, while for linear 
classifiers. So for simpler models, it really matters whether there is a small or large difference between the non-severe and the severe groups. Um, it's obviously much easier to identify severe patients if they are, uh, if they are f um, a lot older than the non-severe ones. But this um, effect is not present for machine learning models. So at least in terms of age group difference, mean age difference between the groups, um, we can see the same performance um, throughout. So machine learning models seem to be much more robust to different patient populations. And uh, the fundamental clinical implication is that even though there may not be a huge difference between um, AUCs and uh, sensitivities and specificities between the different model types, it, um, it actually has a huge effect on the number of patients we would, for example, uh, uh, hospitalize um, in this hypothetical example with the 680 million patients, if we uh, consider a 10% severity um, uh, rate, we would um, select uh, 150 million patients with the simpler clinical scores, but only 80 million with the, with the more sophisticated uh, neural network models. So that's a close to a 50% reduction. And this is with the same sensitivity. So the, the number of false negatives is around the same for, for all, all the types. So it, it matters a lot in terms of ICU occupancy and resource management. And the methods implications are that um, um, even though we see better results, this, the, this problem was not really suited for, for the deep learning type models. I'll talk about this a little bit later. You can see that simpler out of the box machine learning tools like random forests or boosting models perform uh, really, really well. And it's not worth to default to simpler clinical scores and logistic regressions most often used. Um, so the strength, I think, of uh, I think of this uh, meta-analysis is its unique uh, breadth and depth, and it, it I think it helps uh, guide clinicians in choosing the right tools, and uh, and the implications are also useful, I think, for future uh, uh, de tool development. And the limitations are that this may not have been the most uh, 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 the, the the best problem to lo actually look at the the, the uh, the difference between the different model types and there's a high collinearity of explanatory factors so it's hard to disentangle what exactly causes a higher or lower uh, classification performance and obviously hospitalization policies may matter a lot. So as I said the second um, topic is about developing such a, such a severity prediction tool based on the, the already available registries so uh, I would like to thank all those working uh, in these registries. We have around 1,700 patients. And um, we've seen so far that deep learning models perform really well in certain cases like, like imaging applications. So where there's transfer learning possible, what we learned on some of the images, that knowledge can be transferred to other images. And also, uh, for, uh, you will uh, probably use ChatGPT by now, so you see that in the large language models are really we have become really powerful. So we like to employ that as much as we can. Um, so again, we look we will be first looking at COVID nineteen patients and we'll try to develop a, a GPT style model uh, for severity prediction. And um, actually. This is the proposed architecture. I don't unfortunately have time to go into the details. Maybe uh, uh, later we can do that. But the, the key thing is that um, compared to the already existing deep learning severity models, uh, prediction models out there, uh, we will try to incorporate as much external knowledge as we can. Um, and um, this, this will mean that we, will, we need less problem specific data and this uh, proposed architecture uh, will be useful for many other applications besides COVID. Okay, um, thank you for your attention and I'm open to questions. Thank you for your uh, nice presentation. My question is that, uh, is there any other work, uh, previous uh, work that uh, um, collect so comprehensively uh, like you 
the data or comparing these prediction models maybe in another disease uh, group or, or a similar study to yours? Thank you. So for other diseases, yes. For COVID, there are small studies with um, um, assessing some of the models. Um, it, it was only done for uh, detection of COVID. So instead of using some kind of a PCR test, we could look at uh, chest um, uh, scans, something like that, but not for severity prediction. Um, congratulations on your work. Uh, it just left me curious. You also compare like studies from China and from the other region. Can you tell me uh, why and what was done on Pozhen of it? Thank you. Well, I've put that result there because besides the the tool type and this this region, the region of patients was the most important determinant of uh, model performance. And as in China, they've reported much better results than in any other part of the world. It's it's really hard to tell why actually. So we've tried to um, try to go go into this. Uh, but but it's not not yet clear for us uh, yet. We're we're still we're still working on it. And it's really hard to to know why. So you also I think listed as a limitation that COVID was easy uh, somehow to predict. So maybe if you can elaborate on that a, a bit more. So that's one one request I would have. And the other one is if you could explain if you would use the same method what you use here for COVID for any other disease, would you expect any difference? Like what makes COVID unique that you, Basically, that necessitates such a study that compares different statistical methods or other diseases. Okay, so regarding your first question, what makes COVID easy is that um, deep learning models perform when, but well when there's usually some kind of inherent structure in the data, like in images. So the 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 pixels are structured in such a way in a regular grid. And uh, when we have tabular data, simply just a list of laboratory um, values, there, there is no inherent structure in that. So that's why we wanted to uh, sort of incorporate that extra knowledge, infusing that, uh, in a, the, that structure onto the data. So when we compare models that only use clinical uh, variables and lab tests and no, no imaging data whatsoever, and we compare those to those that only use imaging data, we see the same results. So there's no added benefit of, 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 of getting x-rays once we have all the lab data. So that if, if, if a disease is, is, such, is, is like that, then we don't expect to see great results from deep learning models. And uh, for, uh, regarding your second question, I think this, this was a really good opportunity to do such a study because most of these models were developed in the last three years. So the, the methodological knowledge out there is about the same. If we look at any other, basically any other disease, a lot of tools have been developed many years or de even decades ago that are still in use, but machine learning and deep learning knowledge back then wasn't as uh, comprehensive as it is now. I saw that uh, you had uh, patients uh, from uh, Hempal Hospital, right? And the registry, yes, 500 or something. Um, uh, is your tool useful for children and adults as well? Um, I think so, but um, it, it's th this, um, this um, project is in a really early phase, so I can't really tell whether there will be a difference we obviously have much less data for children, but that that because of the external knowledge used, that might not be a problem. We will see.